Hi, I'm Hari Srinivasan from the PBS NewsHour. Welcome to our fireside hangout on Google+. This is one in a series of conversations with senior White House officials. Google+, Plus has been doing hangouts for a while now, including with the President after last year's State of the Union address. But this is the first with the administration in its second term. Today, we're looking forward to a good conversation with Vice President Joe Biden for a discussion on a topic at the top of everyone's mind, reducing gun violence. The Vice President has been leading a task force on gun violence, which he says has met with more than 200 groups of stakeholders and crafted a set of policy proposals that the President announced last week. Some of these include executive actions the President already signed. But the significant changes are proposals which require congressional action. We'll get to some of those in this conversation. Mr. Vice President, welcome to Google+. Plus. Harry, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And you're absolutely right. Uh, after what happened in Newtown and those 20 young children massacred and the teachers as well, uh, the president asked me to go back because I've dealt with this issue in my career as former chairman of the Judiciary Committee writing the crime bill on the first assault weapons ban and, and uh, the increase in background checks, et cetera. And he asked me to put together uh, a set of proposals that would uh, ameliorate uh, and hopefully uh, significantly reduce the amount of gun violence in America. And toward that end, I met with 228 groups from law enforcement officers to pro-gun groups, including the NRA, to uh, sportsmen's organizations, educators, physicians, research people. And uh, there actually is a beginning of emergence of a consensus of some of the positive things we can do to impact on uh, gun violence in America. But I'm really anxious to hear what, uh, what everyone else has to say and to try to answer questions because the single best thing we can do is have a national dialogue about this because, as the president said, if we can do something that even if it only impacts on saving one life of a child or an individual out there, it's worth doing. But I think we can do a lot more than that. All right. Let me introduce our guests at this virtual roundtable near your fireside chat. Guy Kawasaki. He's an author and a technology expert living in Palo Alto, California. Good morning. Hey, Guy. Phil DeFranco, who's a media entrepreneur and popular host of the Phil DeFranco Show on YouTube, which I'm sure you watch, Mr. Biden. Well, I actually, I have seen it. I wish I had your hair. <laughs> All right. I have Theresa Tillett. Uh, Theresa Tillett, a mother and grandmother living in Hartford County, Connecticut. How are Hi. You? Good to see you. And Kimberly Blaine, she's a popular blogger and a therapist who leads several parenting communities on Google+. She's joining us from Los Angeles, California. Hello, Kimberly. Honor to meet you, sir. So, Mr. Vice President, they've got questions of their own, and they've been gathering questions from large communities <clears throat> on Google+. And as a programming note to our audience, none of these have been shared with the Vice President ahead of time. And with that said, considering Senator Feinstein is presenting new legislation on assault weapons and ammunition magazines right now, I'm starting with Phil DeFranco, who's got a question about this. Yes, uh, Mr. Vice President, the 1994 Violent Criminal or Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, uh, known as the Assault Weapons Ban, uh, expired because it was proven to be ineffective at reducing violent crime. And according to FBI.gov's violent crime stats, assault weapons, as defined by the bill, um, account for less than 1% of homicides annually. In fact, that's less than hammer murders. Uh, so my question is, what reasonable measures can we implement that might reduce the loss of life as opposed to repeating the same failed laws of previous administrations? Well, let me set the record straight in your question. It did not expire because it proved ineffective. It expired because it had to be reauthorized in 10 years. When I originally wrote the legislation, not only to get it passed, there was an agreement that it would have a 10-year life and have to be reauthorized. And the last administration chose not to seek reauthorization. That's number one. Number two, it is true that the vast majority of gun deaths in America are not a consequence of the use of an assault weapon. But that begs the issue of whether or not assault weapons have any real utility, either A, in terms of any, any sporting or self-protection needs that, look, as you know, the the uh, Supreme Court recently ruled that it is, that is an, an individual right to bear arms. An individual right. That used to be a debate. It no longer is a debate. And I've just had that position my whole career. Number two, they said, though, that there, it is constitutional to put reasonable limitations on who can own and what kind of arms can be owned. 
Now, one of the reasons why the assault weapons ban makes sense, even though it accounts for a small percentage of the murders or those who die as a consequence of a weapon every year, is because police organizations overwhelmingly support it because they get outgunned. They are outgunned on the street by the bad guys and the proliferation of these weapons. When, in fact, there were fewer police being murdered, fewer police being victimized, being outgunned, when the assault weapons ban, in fact, was in existence. When it, and the number of assaults on police officers and the deadly assaults on them has gone up since the ban has been lifted. It is not an answer to all the problems, but it's a rational, in my view, a rational limitation on the, uh, on what type of weapons should be owned, could be owned. And and uh, Mr. Biden, when you say uh, the rational, uh, what would you say to people saying that uh, some of this legislation, especially against AR, when you mention um, the police deaths, it's it's creating policy based on outliers rather than um, really hitting the the real issue. Well, I think is. look, we do get to the real issue, and I assume. Philip, we're going to get a chance to talk about it in this chat. We do get to the real issue, which is the vast majority of, 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 of gun deaths. And by the way, there's been over 1,200 just in, in America just since what happened up in Connecticut in Newtown. Um, but uh, the fact of the matter is it does negatively impact upon the physical health and well-being of police officers and others. And it is in no way no way does it deny or trench upon a legitimate restriction on the type of weapon that can be owned. And, 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 so, and, the, and the courts concluded that as well. So the idea that it doesn't solve every problem, although it only solves part of a problem, without trenching on anyone's individual rights, but because it doesn't solve the whole problem, you shouldn't do it, I don't buy the logic of that. Mr. Vice President, uh, there have been several people online asking about the fact that you are a gun owner. You own two shotguns. Yes. What's your interpretation of the Second Amendment? My interpretation of the Second Amendment is an individual. It is an individual right, not a corporate right, not related to a militia. You have an individual right to own a weapon both for recreation, for hunting, and also for your self-protection. You have an individual right to do that. But just as you don't have an individual right to go out and buy an F-15 if you're a billionaire with ordnance on it, just like you don't have the right to go buy an M1 tank, just like you don't have a right to buy an automatic weapon, those judgments have been made that there are no societal, reasonable societal justification or constitutional justification for owning them. And so my view is that it is totally a guarantee not negotiable, that I'm able to own a weapon for sporting purposes as well as my own protection, but there should be rational limits on the type of weapon I can own that exceed the need that, that would go beyond what I need for my protection or legitimate sporting activities. All right, I want to turn it over to Teresa Tillett. She's actually applying for a permit for gun ownership now. Teresa? Hi, Ms. Vice President. My question, is there are many <clears throat> many gun owning families that are feeling picked on and um, they're feeling that they're being attacked and punished with these new restrictions when the as you said the majority of the gun deaths and the shootings are being committed by known criminals when will the current criminal laws be fully enforced well, we are attempting to fully enforce the, the current criminal laws, but let, let me say two things, Teresa. No, number one, there is a legitimate, respected, and I think uh, as old as the country, culture of gun ownership in America. My dad was a hunter. My dad uh, had, uh, had a gun case full of some fairly valuable weapons. He had some hard times. He had to sell them when I was a kid. I own two shotguns. My son owns shotguns. Um, and, you know, uh, where I come from in Delaware, I'll never forget going down to an area in southern Delaware to meet the one woman who was very involved in the Democratic Party. And, and uh, I'll never forget her walking out in the backyard. She was 72 years old. And she said, Joe, do you own a gun? And I said, only a shotgun. She said, well, come out and let me show you mine. 
and she's out there and she's firing a shotgun at her barn and she's 78 years old and said, my daddy gave me this gun. It's a legitimate and respected tradition. And I think it should be honored. And it is not the problem, not the cause of the problems we have. With regard to the question of employing and enforcing the laws now, we do that, Theresa, in two ways. Right now, there is no federal law against gun trafficking. You'd think there would be. There is no federal law against gun trafficking. There is no federal way to impose restrictions on straw purchasers. You go out and file for a permit or you go out and purchase a weapon, you do it legally. That's why 98% or 90% of all gun owners support tougher background checks because they know they're legit and they know they're illegit people going out and getting those weapons. There's a third thing. An awful lot of the gun violence in America is a consequence of gangbangers, the drug trade, uh, stolen weapons, weapons that are, are in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the black market. And that's why I continue to push for a continuation of the so-called Biden crime bill as it relates to cops. We think we need another 15,000 law enforcement officers on the street nationwide because in Connecticut and Delaware, across the country, because of tough economic times that require to balance budgets in states, they've laid off law enforcement officers. So across the board, we are trying to enforce the existing laws we have and make reasonable changes in those laws that keep... There's a fellow you, that I met with, or these groups I met with, he said, look, it's not about keeping bad guns out of the hands of good people. It's about keeping all guns out of the hands of bad people. Mr. Vice President, uh, if this assault weapons ban was to go into effect, it still does nothing to address a grandfather clause, all the weapons that already exist out there today. Is there a real possibility that this just accelerates the black market or the secondary market for the sale of these weapons? No, I don't think so. There's hard to, it's hard to imagine how you could accelerate the sale more rapidly than has already been accelerated. But the reason to do it is just ask your local police department. The idea that there are a lot of these weapons out there now, and therefore you should do nothing about putting more of them out there in the market because they're already there, that's, that doesn't seem logical to me, nor does it seem logical to all the police agencies with whom I dealt with. They just want to, they'd love to be able to do something about the ones that are out there, but realistically, that's not going to happen. But increasing the stock that's out there is not in anyone's interest, and it does nothing to violate anyone's Second Amendment rights. All right. Several of the executive actions, as well as the congressional suggestions, have to do with mental health. And I want to turn to Kimberly Blaine now, who's speaking today as a parent and as a, as a mental health practitioner. Kimberly? Yes, thank you. Uh, so so good to meet you, Vice President. This, nice is, to an meet you, this is an honor. Um, you know, parents are absolutely thrilled that you're investing in strategies to make schools safer. However, there is a great concern that we're leaping too quickly into a one size fits all by having more uh, police on schools. We kind of, you know, believe that prevention uh, should be the main focus. Um, you know, dealing with and identifying at risk children and youth. So, my question, our question to you is. Are you proposing sending more armed guards into school or um, having schools hire more mental health professionals? Well, quite frankly, uh, you probably forgot more about this subject than most people know based on your background. Let me say where we are. Mm -hmm. The first and most important thing is to engage in trying to come up with ways to prevent, prevent children who are at risk from falling into a circumstance where they're, 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 whatever mental problems they may have, whatever emotional problems they have, before they metastasize into behavior that is antisocial. And so one of the things we've, we've done, we're, uh, we're proposing, is a new, pro a, a, a new project called Project Aware, where we are going in, just like you teach school teachers about everything from CPR to basic first aid, we are able to go in and with, this, with this proposal and train school personnel to identify aberrant behavior that warrants someone like you, our professional, looking at it. 
And so there is a mechanism by which we are going to provide that kind of training for school districts around the country and school teachers and administrators if they want it. It's called for it's a $40 million proposal to begin this process. The second piece of this is there also is a requirement once that that conduct is is observed and it warrants a professional looking at it to be able to get to the parents or the legal guardian and say, here are a menu of people you can go to. This is where you can get help. This is how you can get the help. Thirdly, because of what you know, the mental health parity that was passed in 2008, and because of the Affordable Care Act, the combination of those two things means that there is now affordable mental health care that will be available to all Americans. You have thousands of young children, as you know, aging out of Medicaid, for example, with mental health facility, mental health uh, um, assistance from professionals who age out and all of a sudden they're not covered. So the whole idea is preventative here, preventative, to identify before before the problem metastasizes. There's a second piece. We are not calling for armed guards in schools. We are not calling for, uh, we think it'd be a terrible mistake to, my wife's a full-time educator, full-time teacher, teaches a full load right now, now at a community college, but for years in the public high school system. The last thing we need to do is be arming school teachers and administrators. But we did have in the original Biden crime bill that put 100,000 cops in the street, the option for districts to choose a school resource officer. That is a sworn officer, a uniformed officer, armed or unarmed, up to the school, in the school, where just like community policing work because people in the neighborhood get to know the law enforcement officer, trust them and report to them students establishing relationship with a law enforcement officer to say, by the way, John, I just want you to know, and open my locker this morning, the guy two lockers down, I saw the butt of a gun in his, you know, in, in his locker. Don't tell anybody. There's a drug deal going to go down after school. It worked. It worked to lessen violence in the school. Now, we think it should be made more flexible. So in the proposal that we're making to make a hundred, excuse me, a thousand of these school resource officers available, we're making it flexible enough for your school district could say, by the way, we'd like to compete for that money, but we don't want a law enforcement officer in our school. We want to hire a school psychologist with that money. So it's totally up to the school district as to how they want to use that money. But it's not about arming the schools. As the mayor of Chicago said, our schools, by and large, are relatively safe. It's getting to and from school where kids are the most unsafe, least safe. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, the amount that he mentioned, $40 million, does that seem like a drop in the bucket to you? Does that seem enough? Well, that's just, a, I think, a portion of the funding that they're allocating toward this, because I see there's a, there's $150 million to hire psychologists, exactly. social workers. So, But for that specific program, which is Project AWARE, which, by the way, we are thrilled about this, so don't get me wrong, this is fantastic. Um, this does seem like a really huge nut to crack. As we said, we want um, uh, um, safety for the children. We want to be sure that mental health issues are being addressed very early on um, in the school system and that teachers are empowered to come forth and say, am I allowed to say who I'm identifying in my class that might need services? We want to be sure. And so I don't know if 40 million is enough to train these it's teachers. Not. So we hope it is. By the way, it's not. But like every other program that I've been responsible for as a senator in the crime bill, you've got to, gem you've got to demonstrate that it works and it's useful. The whole idea is that local communities at the end of the day would pick up this responsibility. This cannot be just a federal responsibility. These are local schools. This is a local requirement. That's what the whole COPS bill was about. 
Initially, people said, is there enough money? We're not, you're not paying Biden for the 100,000 cops over. So we're, no, we're not. What we're doing is we're going to give you 75% of the money for five years. you got to maintain effort here. You can't reduce your police force if you take this money. And then you got to decide as a community, do you want to continue to fund these law enforcement officers? Guess what? It worked. Violent crime was reduced significantly. And so this is not a total federal responsibility. The way the federal government can lead is look at best practices, make them available to schools and school districts and states, as well as provide seed money to get this moving. But $40 million, the total package is $55 million on top of the other money Kimberly talked about. That's not enough to take care of the 90,000 schools, but it is a way to begin the process and demonstrate it works. Mr. Vice President, uh, none of this happens in a vacuum. This is a very political time that we all live in. Uh, Guy Kawasaki is joining us from California. He's been trying to unpack some of this, Guy. Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice President. Good morning, Guy. It, you know, what you say seems logical and reasonable with respect for both sides of the argument, Second Amendment and gun safety. Uh, why is this so hard? I mean, how did it come to this point where special interest seems to control Congress, and, you know, even to the point of what research can be done? How did we get to this point? Well, look, um, let me choose my words here. Both left and right <laughs> sometimes take absolutist <laughs> positions. Um, and yet the vast majority of the American people agree on certain basic, basic principles relating to, to public safety and gun safety. And um, uh, what happens is, for example, you'll hear, uh, and I met with the NRA, by the way, um, you'll hear the NRA say, well, that may not be so bad, but it's a slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. If you allow that to happen, then next thing you know, you're going to call for firearms registration, gun registration, and you're going to be able to confiscate my weapon, etc. And so part of this is um, uh, um, when the original crime bill was passed in 94, there was a great concern and consensus about the rise of gratuitous violence in America. And so there was a, there, there, there was a UN cry going up nationally. In a sense, the crime bill worked too well. Because what happened is violent crime diminished significantly. And as a consequence of that, those folks who represent a minority of the people who are much more energized by their, from their perspective, were able to come in and undo a lot of what had been positively done. For example, as you point out, Guy, there are provisions in the law that were added in what they call riders to appropriations bills that were interpreted as a saying, the, the Center for Disease Control can't even keep statistics on gun violence, can't even do research on this. Let me give you an example. When I first got to the, senator, uh, to the Senate as a 30-year-old kid, the big issue was not about guns, it was about automobile safety, highway fatalities. And some of the automobile industry argued that the National Safety Council, Highway Safety Council, could not keep statistics. They were not able to keep statistics. It was after, it was after Ralph Nader's book, Unsafe at Any Speed. And so when I got down here as a 30-year-old kid, I was perplexed. How could that be? And I figured out why they didn't want to do it. Once we were able to start to keep the statistics and the National Highway Safety Council got engaged, they found out that the vast majority of people driving an automobile who were killed in an accident were killed because they were impaled by the steering column. There was a simple answer to that. Say to the engineers, build a column that can, in fact, release. Guess what? It costs more money. Automobile makers didn't like it, but we passed it. Deaths went down dramatically, the same way passengers. Why were they dying? They weren't getting thrown through the front windshield. And, be, and that was the argument the automobile guy said, just have a, re, a restraint on your lap. They said, no, you need a seatbelt. Because why? They found out a majority or significant per, a percentage of people being killed were hitting their head, fracturing their skull on that bar that goes up from the body of the car to the roof or on the bar that goes aside. Guess what? Put on a restraint. Restraints cost more money. But once the research was done, what's happened? We build much safer automobiles. Mm -hmm. 
And the one thing that bothers me is there's part of the part of the interest population, interest group population out there that that are afraid of facts. Let the facts lead where they will and let the research be done. And that's one of the things the president and I believe very strongly. Let the facts work, including you're out in California, including with regard to the entertainment industry. There is no hard data as to whether or not these excessively violent video games, in fact, cause people to engage in behavior that is antisocial, including using guns. There is one study done, I think it was, I, I, I can't, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics. They said if you watch three to six hours, kids while watching three to six hours of video games, a lot of kids do that, can lead to aggressive behavior. They didn't make the next connection saying that leads to violent behavior, but there's no studies done. So I recommended to the president that we do significant research. Let CDC, let the National Institute of Health, let these people go out and look at the pathology that's behind this, if there is a pathology relating to gun violence. We shouldn't be afraid of the facts. Okay. So, you know, I, as you say, I'm a citizen of California. Uh, Dianne Feinstein's my senator. Yep. You know, clearly, the, the representatives of my state are pro-gun control. But what can a citizen of a state who, like me, who the elected representatives are already supporting gun control, what do you do, what can I do? As, does Dianne Feinstein need more support, or do well, I write to national? Um, what do I do? I, you know, I, I, I and first of all, I, I don't view it as gun control. I view it as gun safety. It ranges everything okay. from making sure you... You, you, you keep your weapon out of the reach of kids to making sure that, we, uh, that, that, that we're able to make sure bad guys don't, they get in the registry so they can't buy a gun. Um, but look, as the president said when he introduced the recommendation, he, he took the recommendations that I sent to him and laid out what he thought it should be done. He said, look, this is up to the American people. Let, uh, let, let me give you an example. 98%, according to New York Times poll, 98% of the American people believe that there should be tighter controls on who can own a gun, who can keep the guns out of the hands of felons and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, folks who are adjudicated mentally incompetent to own, own a gun, et cetera. Um, but what happens is, as you know, in the political system, the elected officials respond to intensity. And so if it's number 10 on your list, of things you want your congressman to do is to do something about gun safety. And that's not going to get you very far. And if it's number, if there's a smaller group, it's number one on their list to make sure there's nothing done. Guess who they hear from? And so make your voices heard. That's one of the reasons I wanted to be in this chat. There's tens of thousands of people listening to this. I don't care which side of the issue you're on. Pick those things that you think can have a positive impact. If you don't agree with me on assault weapons, then you probably agree with me, and not then, you may, probably, you may agree with me on background checks, making them universal. Make your voices heard. This outfit, this town listens when people rise up and speak. Mr. Vice hey. President, I know we've just got a couple of minutes left with you, unless, of course, you want to stay longer, and we'd, we'd no, love I, to I, have I'm you. happy to stay a little longer if you guys want okay, to. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Phil I was DeFranco, told each I of you to... had two questions. I'm happy to do it. Absolutely. Phil DeFranco, I know uh, a lot of your folks were talking about video games on your board as well. Um, yeah, there was, there was a, a big conversation of video games, $10 million spent into the, the research of, of movies, video games, violence. And I, I think there is something there. Before that, I did want to hit, you were talking about the, the facts. So I did go to FBI.gov, um, which I, I have up. I think it is uh, unbiased research that has shown that since the, the assault weapon ban expired, while firearm sales have increased, the number of murders have gone down. And you previously mentioned the 1,200 firearm-related deaths, but not assault rifles. Um, so what would you say to the people that say, yes, you are infringing on our rights, not for sporting or for hunting, but in California, everyone talks about the big earthquake or some terrible natural disaster as a last line of defense. What would you say to those well, people? Well, I, I would say weapons? there's an awful, uh, you know, guess what? A shotgun will keep you a lot safer, a double barrel shotgun than uh, the assault weapons in somebody's hands who doesn't know how to use it, even one who does know how to use it. You know, it's harder to use an assault weapon than hit something that is a shotgun, okay? So you want to keep people away in the earthquake, buy some shotgun shells. 
Um, okay. not, uh, number one. But anyway, and, and, uh, with regard to violent crime going down, I'm very proud it went down. It went proud in large part. The reason it went down is we put 100,000 cops on the street. But that didn't mean the cops were safer as a consequence of these guns. The cops were less safe the more assault weapons were on the street. They don't account for even not only a bulk, they account for a small percentage of the gun crimes in America. More people, more people out there get shot with a Glock that has a that that has cartridges that, that you can have magazines that can put two, ten, eight, twelve, fifteen. 30 shells in it than from any assault weapon you see. I'm much less concerned, quite frankly, about uh, um, what you call an assault weapon than I am about magazines and the number of rounds that can be held in a magazine. But the point is that the fact that violent crime is down and there's been a proliferation of assault weapons, quote unquote, as was defined up to now, on the street, uh, does not suggest that taking the assault weapons off the street would not, in fact, make it safer, particularly for the folks who are mostly outgunned cops. And you previously mentioned the, the magazine sizes. Yes. So I guess my question with that is the, the gunman in Connecticut fired 150 rounds, meaning that he had to swap out his 30-round magazines at least four times. Yep. Um, with how fast it you, you can swap out a magazine, do you think limiting the, the, the magazine size to 10 will have well, an impact? Well, let's assume, uh, by the way, your facts are correct. About 30, yes. uh, he had some of magazines, I think only had 20 shells, but I'm not sure, okay. 30 shells. So we had to swap out four or five times. If it, was, if, it was, if it was 10 shells in there, he would have had to swap out 30 times, or he would have stopped out, have to swap out um, uh, 25 times. And so Which what is, would happen is the response time, in fact, may have saved one kid's life. Maybe, maybe it took longer, maybe one more kid would be alive. Let, let me give you, give you an example. Uh, in, the, in the case of Gabby Gifford, when the guy had to swap out a new magazine, he fumbled. He fumbled. And he was able, and an older woman reached up and grabbed his hand, and they subdued him. All of them would have been dead had he not had to change that magazine, had there been 30 clips in that magazine, or 40 clips in that magazine. The same way with Aurora. A guy had 100 shells in the magazine. Fortunately, it jammed. It jammed enough that it gave time for folks to get there and, in fact, save lives. So, look, I'm not making the argument that this will end crime or this is. I make the argument this way. There is no sporting need that I'm aware of to have a magazine that holds 50 rounds. None that I'm aware of. And I'm a sportsman. Number one. Number two, there is no dim diminution of your ability to physically protect yourself having 10 clips in a round. I mean, having 10 rounds in a clip instead of 30 or 40 rounds. And what it does do, now for a professional, it only takes you, you go to the FBI, you'll, you're still, they'll show it takes a second and three quarters for a pro to change the clip. But not, these, not, not all these people are pros. And so if you just give another, if it took another, uh, you know, a minute and a half, two minutes, who, who knows who, who, who else might have been alive? And those kids may be alive, some of them. Mr. Vice President, uh, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank and you. on behalf of all of us. I appreciate it very much. Write your congressman. For or against, <laughs> write your congressman. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks Thank a you. lot, everybody.